They were, of course, instantly branded as sellouts, as I'm sure plenty of people in the comments are going to say. They were banned from Gilman, and overnight, they became one of the most hated bands in the eyes of the DIY punk community. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. Welcome back to my How They Got So Big series, where I deconstruct important bands and do my best to figure out how they got to where they are. In this episode, I'm going to talk about a band that's very near and dear to me, and that band is Green Day. Back in 1993 or so, my friend Kevin showed up to school with a tape by a brand new pop punk band in his Walkman. The name of the band was Green Day, and the album was called Kerplunk. And I'd seen them play shows with other bands I liked, like Operation Ivy and Crimp Shrine. I grew up in Seattle and I only went to, I think, two shows at Gilman. But that 90s Bay Area Gilman scene was also home to the bands that I was just absolutely obsessed with, like Spaz, Capitalist Casualties, Dystopia, Man is the Bastard. And although Green Day couldn't possibly be more different in terms of their sound, the bands I just talked about would be like Grindcore or Power Violence bands. They were part of the same community, and I personally was really excited to see one of the Gilman bands blow up and put that scene on the map. So how did they go from playing basement punk shows to selling tens of millions of albums, packing arenas, all over the world and inspiring thousands of kids to start their own band? I'll do my best to answer that question in this video, so let's get into it. Key factor number one, the DIY punk scene. As I said in the intro, Green Day's roots are in the DIY punk scene, specifically in the early 90s scene that revolved around a legendary venue in Berkeley, California, right outside San Francisco, called 924 Gilman Street. Now, I'm not going to try to tell the whole story of Gilman here because that's a whole other video in itself, and other people can do a much better job than I can, but I really can't say enough about how vibrant and special this scene was back then and how important it was to Green Day's career. Basically, Gilman was kind of like the West Coast CBGB and the period where Green Day came up was like the years when Blondie and the Ramones were coming up in 70s New York City. There was just this explosion of creative energy around Gilman back then and Green Day was right there in the heart of it. Again, I'm not going to try to document all of this. I'm not going to try to list all of the bands or part of the scene because there's just way too many of them. But a couple of my personal favorites that you may want to check out if you're not familiar with them would be Operation Ivy, J Church, Tilt, Econochrist, and last but definitely, definitely not least, Sticky. But getting back to the point of this video, basically what it comes down to is they were in the right place at exactly the right time. There was this incredibly vibrant scene happening right in their backyard. They jumped into it and this, in my opinion, was the spark that ignited the rest of their career for two reasons. First and most obviously, this scene was an existing ecosystem that essentially solved the two biggest problems that most new bands face, namely audience and distribution for their music. There was a whole network of venues like Gilman and the Cattle Club, labels like Lookout, Honey Bear, and a personal favorite of mine, Asian Man Records, zines like Maximum Rock and Roll and Comet Bus, and tons of people who would go to essentially any DIY show to support whatever band was playing. And to be clear, I'm not taking anything away from them. Yes, they were in the right place at the right time, but like I said in my Fallout Boy video, that only takes you so far. It is on you to make the most of it, and that is what they did. They played with everybody, including some really odd lineups with hardcore bands like Blast and Shelter, and a lot of more or less crust-punk bands like Destroy, Filth, Neurosis. And if you're not familiar with these bands, these are the most ultra-DIY, quote-unquote, punk-as-fuck bands that you could possibly find back then. And, like I said, Green Day played with a ton of them. The point here is that they were not scene tourists that randomly happened to play with a few DIY bands on their way to becoming rock stars. They were right there in the trenches, playing in basements and backyards of punk houses on the floor of DIY record stores like Epicenter and yes, of course, at Gilman. And this led to their big break, which came in 1988 when they signed to Lookout Records, which was kind of like the label counterpart to Gilman. It was the label at the heart of the Bay Area DIY scene back then, and it just put out the debut EP from Operation Ivy, who, as most of you know, featured Tim and Matt that would later go on to form Rancid. And the rest is history. They put out two albums for Lookout, which sold incredibly well for a DIY punk band, and that eventually got them on the radar of major labels. And the second thing, which is less obvious, is that in addition to giving them that initial launch pad for their career, it instilled and honed ethics and values in them that would inform the rest of their career. The same values that made them stand out from other bands and connect with millions of kids all over the world. And here's why. The Gilman scene was built on a set of more or less clearly defined values, as illustrated by the sign that hangs on the door
lore of Gilman to this very day. And although I'm sure plenty of people are going to disagree with me in the comments, to me, it's crystal clear how Green Day have upheld these values throughout their career. Of, of course, within the context of being a major label band where you do have to make some compromises. For example, taking out the aggressively queer band Pansy Division on one of their first big tours, to the entire American Idiot album, to bringing fans on stage with them to play the songs that the band and kind of an arena rock version of how you get up on stage at a punk show, grab the mic, sing a couple lines, and jump back into the crowd. And to those of us who grew up in the DIY scene, that stuff may seem kind of obvious, but to a kid who's never had exposure to those values, these ideas are mind-blowing, and I think it's a huge part of why people love them. Because I think most kids have a very sensitive bullshit detector, and by the same token, they also recognize and love people like Green Day, they keep it real, don't play the rock star bullshit, and actually believe in and support a community. And key factor number two is that they sold out, or did they? So look, given that the topic of this video is how did Green Day get so big, clearly part of the answer to that question is that they signed to Warner Brothers to release Dookie. It's a major label with the kind of resources and relationships that Lookout or any other indie label at that time just didn't have. And these days it's debatable whether you need a label at all to build a global following, but in 1994 it was a very different story. Back then it could cost well over $100,000 to record a major label quality album, and because there was no internet to speak of, you also needed the cash to print physical copies of release, and to market it you had to buy expensive print ads, you had to get airplay on radio and MTV, and needless to say radio and MTV were not going to give Lookout any attention. The bottom line is that it was a lot harder and more expensive to put out music back then, and signing to Warner meant that Green Day would have the resources to make a great sounding record, including over $100,000 to record Dookie, and also market that album to millions of people, and that's something that was just not going to happen on a DIY punk label. They wanted to be the biggest band in the world, and to do that, they needed to sign to a major. Now, I'm not trying to turn this video into a referendum on Green Day's punk cred, but I think that's where the conversation is going to go, so I do want to touch on it. And I can't say what was going through their heads when they considered this decision to sign to a major, but I am sure that it was not easy, because they knew that they would be burning a lot of the bridges to the DIY community that they love. And as you may have heard, that is exactly what happened. They were, of course, instantly branded as sellouts, as I'm sure plenty of people in the comments are going to say. They were banned from Gilman, and overnight they became one of the most hated bands in the eyes of the DIY punk community. But here's what I love about Green Day, and kind of the main thing I wanted to get across in this video, is that although the DIY community turned its back on them, they never turned their back on the community. And again, I'm not here to be the defense attorney in the trial of Green Day's punk credibility, but they've done a lot of things for the community that I personally think are pretty cool. Here's a couple examples. Back in 2008, as you can see here, they bought Gilman a brand new sound system. A few years back, Billy Joe did a side project with Tim Armstrong and his son called The Armstrongs, and all the proceeds of that went to benefit Gilman. Back in 2015, they played a show to benefit the punk publishing company AK Press when their warehouse burned down. You heard me talk earlier about the excellent East Bay punk documentary Turn It Around, which I highly suggest you turn out. They executive produced that movie. And in this context, executive produced usually means paid for. I mentioned Pansy Division earlier, the aggressively queer punk band they took out with them on tour, and I just wanted to share this clip about how seriously they took that decision. There was a show in Fairfax, Virginia, where uh, the promoter did not want us on the bill. So Green Day said, if Pansy Division don't play, we don't play. We played the show. And lastly, when they signed to Warner, they made sure to structure their deal so that Lookout would actually still own their first two albums. That was their way of paying it forward and helping the label that helped them get to where they were. And they didn't have to do any of that. They could have said, oh, you guys don't like us anymore? Well, fuck you too. We're rock stars now and we don't need you, so go fucking kick rocks. But they didn't. They took the high road and as somebody who really believes in positivity and getting rid of the gatekeeper punk police bullshit, I absolutely love this. I love that they continually take the high road. And just a quick aside, I'm not going to get into it too much here, but I also have to give Steve Aoki some props for that too. As you may or may not know, he kind of came up in the same scene as I did, the 90s DIY hardcore scene, and he still cares about hardcore too. Check out his punk label Dim Mock Records if you haven't. So, the big question, did they sell out? Well, according to Steve Albini and a bunch of kids who wrote letters to Maximum Rock and Roll back in the 90s, the answer is yes. And if that's what you think, there's nothing I can do or say to talk you out of it, but in my opinion, the whole idea of like accusing people of 
of selling out, of calling people sellouts, really just shows you how endemic, quote unquote, tall poppy syndrome is in punk culture. If you haven't heard that term, here's the basic idea. A perceived tendency to discredit or disparage those who have achieved notable wealth or prominence in public life. Sounds pretty familiar, right? But anyway, to get back to the original topic, regardless of how you feel about this decision, signing to a major label was, without a doubt, the key decision that took them from being a big fish in the small pond of DIY punk to the top of the billboard charts, to being big fish in the very biggest pond of all. So that was key factor number two, which brings us to key factor number three, their timeless songs. Last, but definitely, definitely not least, the real key to Green Day's success is simple. It's their incredibly great songs. And specifically, that they're not just catchy songs, but the kind of classic, timeless songs that transcend genre and trends and sound great for decades. So yes, they were fortunate to come up in that vibrant Bay Area scene. And yes, signing to a major label gave them the resources to reach a huge audience. But none of that would have been enough for them to get this big without the songs. And just to prove this out, look at the many other 90s bands who also came from the DIY scene and signed to major labels, but couldn't break out like Green Day did. Jawbox, Shudder to Think, and Jawbreaker are just a few examples of that. And the reason why the major label jump worked so well for Green Day, where it didn't work for others, is deceptively simple. The answer is in Green Day's hooks, their choruses, the lyrics that are as close to universally appealing as you're going to get. And that is why a major label is perfect for them. Because they had the kind of material that they knew would appeal to millions of people all over the world, they just needed a platform that would help them get it out there. And I'm just absolutely blown away at the impact their songs have had and how many people love these songs from all different walks of life all over the world. For example, my wife's sister, who mostly listens to Walmart pop country, loves Green Day. She can sing along to every one of their singles. You'll hear Time of Your Life played at high school graduations by people who have never even thought about punk rock in their lives. I saw some middle school kids playing Green Day covers in the park this summer. And the fact that Green Day's music connects with those kids the same way it connected to me and my friends when we were their age 25 years ago is a testament to how universally appealing these are. They're just that damn good that they transcend genre and time and walk of life. Look, it's hard enough to write a hit in any genre, but writing a song that touches millions of people across multiple generations, across decades, that is something only the very, very best can do. And something that, honestly, I'm not sure any punk band has ever done. And I could go on about this forever, but in my opinion, one of the big things is that their references weren't other punk bands. You know, they weren't trying to write songs that sounded like Isocracy and Corrupted Morals. They were trying to write songs that were like Queen or The Beatles. Other bands that have written timeless songs that stayed relevant for decades. And judging by those kids covering their songs in their park, I think they pulled it off. So that is key factor number three. They're timeless, iconic songs. So there you go. That is my two cents on how Green Day got so big and also the impact of their legacy. And like I said, I'm not trying to turn this into a debate about their punk credibility and it's not my job to defend them, but my personal opinion, which this is my video, so I get to say what my opinion is. My personal opinion is that it's really fucking cool to see a band that came from that same like DIY punk community that meant so much to me when I was a kid become literally one of the biggest bands of all time. It's kind of the same thing I talked about in my Fall Out Boy video. Those guys came up in the 90s vegan straight edge scene just like I did, and it's been incredibly cool to see them also get to the level they have and shine a little bit of a light on the scene that we came up in. As far as the whole selling out thing goes, well, you can have your own opinion on it, but to me, like, what's better? Being true and reaching an audience of, you know, a couple thousand people, or making a few compromises and reaching millions and millions of people, many of which are going to get inspired to start their own bands, and then maybe dig a little bit deeper into DIY culture and get into punk? Well, I don't know. Again, it's up to you to decide, but I personally am glad they did things the way that they did. All right, guys, that's all I have for now. If you found this video interesting or entertaining or informative or any of that stuff, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, share it with a friend. Anything that you can do to help spread the word would be very much appreciated. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.